Hello comrades, Commissar Bro here today with Making History, the Second World War. Uh, basically, this is, I believe, the fourth game in the Making History series, not counting any expansions or any DLC like that. But yeah, the fourth game in the series, uh, and pretty much kind of a, a, a pretty strong successor to uh, The Great War, which the last Making History game, I don't know if you played it, but it was about World War I uh, in that unique Making History style. So, um, pretty much, I guess, the biggest thing to mention about this game is, well, before I get into that, this game is made by Factus Games. This is actually their first title. Um, now, they did buy uh, Making History the Great War off of Muzzy Lane Software, but this is their first actual release that they did themselves. Now, going straight into my opinion of it, so far, what I've played, it's very, very similar to Making the History the Great War. So if you enjoyed that, chances are you're very much going to enjoy this one. It expands upon the gameplay of that one, uh, focusing a bit more on improving the naval aspects of play, having air transport, kamikaze units, uh, and pretty much expanding the tech tree quite extensively. I mean, you can go all the way down in this game to sweet, sexy nuclear warheads. That's right. Uh, so, I mean, that's pretty cool that they've expanded to that point. The Making History games were always very moddable as well, so that's one thing uh, that I'm already going to be able to give kudos to. Even in the pre-release version of the game, there were already mods being made by people. Uh, so, what's the closest thing you could probably compare this to? Think Hearts of Iron with depending on how you look at it, it's got a dip different type of depth. Um, I can't really say it's got more depth. I'd say they're about on the same level. Uh, just for example, I think one of the coolest things about this game is that every nation has multiple different cultures and ethnic groups and religions just in sing like one single country. Like a country could be the size of Italy and there's a multitude of different cultures and ethnic groups which are going to affect your stability and your taxation levels and stuff like that. I think that's actually pretty cool, whereas games like Hearts of Iron pretty much just wave that away and they'll say, okay, this country has a particular ethnic group, this country has got a particular ethnic group, and that'll affect your overall industrial capacity and so on and so forth. Making history takes that a step further with different nationalities, different ethnic groups, different religions, and those all have an impact on the overall effectiveness of your country. The larger you get does not necessarily mean the better you get, but ultimately at the end of the day, it does equal more industrial capacity, which equals being able to build more troops, more munitions, and so on and so forth. Now, another way it divul diverges from games like uh, Hearts of Iron is you have to build uh, pretty much, let me, let me find an area that actually has like a... Let's see. Okay, here we go. So you have different, like, buildings that can actually produce things. An aircraft plant, for example, is going to be able to build all my different types of aircraft, from airships to bombers and fighters and so on. Tool factory is going to be able to build my field artillery, my artillery guns, anti-air guns, so on and so forth. Mechanized mill is specific towards, like, goods and arms and so on. Uh, and then you've also got city infrastructure, which, like, military academy, where you can actually recruit troops, that's going to that's gonna come out of that. And so on. Now, I could go on for a while about the various things in the game, but I really kind of just want to give my opinion on it, being that I've been a Making History fan since the original Making History, Calm in the Storm, came out, what, in 2007? So, wow, 11 years ago. I'm getting old. Um, so, anyway, this is pretty much the Great War expanded upon. So, if you really like the Great War, you're probably going to enjoy this. Personally, in my opinion, I did think The Great War was fun and I liked it, but I almost kind of feel like this game hasn't done enough to differentiate itself from the last game. And the reason I believe it should is because making history The Great War was tedious. And I believe this game has made strides in trying to improve that tediousness. It's still tedious. Uh, for example, if I want to increase the industrial capacity of my uh, empire. How do I do that? Well, in this game, you just build more buildings. So you basically actually uh, build your different industries. In the first game, 
it was all one thing. You had a button that was literally that you would click and then you would click down this menu and it would be increased industrial capacity. And everything you could build was right there. Uh, so all industrial capacity could be focused on one thing per city. Now, I like the approach that they went to and the fact of, okay, so one city can produce an artillery gun. It can also improve, or in, it could build bombers. It can also build infantry. So one city can actually become a powerhouse fueling multiple different things. You just have to build it. Now, you still need manpower and stuff like that and so on. Now, the reason... I feel like that's I, I don't like it as much as the original game though is because of the fact that you could have some really ridiculous scenarios where if you increase your industrial capacity enough in one city you are pumping out soldiers like like a whole division of tanks in one turn which a turn is a week so every week I'm pumping out a new division of tanks it's unrealistic but it was fun Whereas in this game, you do have hard limitations. Like, every unit has a certain build time. Uh, for example, if I want to build medium bombers, it's going to take nine turns. Doesn't matter what city it is, it's going to take nine turns. Um, now, I guess if you look at it from a realism perspective, I guess that could make sense. Um, I kind of assume that the bombers, it's not just building the bombers. You're building the bombers, you're training the pilots, and so on and so forth. So... I, you know, there's two different perspectives. Personally, that's just not my cup of tea. I prefer it more when it's kind of in a sandboxy style, where it's like, okay, this is totally nonsensical, but I'm going to train an entire division of infantry in one week, and they're going to be battle-hardened and ready to go. I just, I like that. I like that OP-ness to the game. And again, um, the past couple of Making History games have not really done that. Now, again, don't get me wrong, making history the Great War and the Second World War are definitely better for things like mods. There's more customization that you can really do with those mods. So, I mean, that's pretty cool. And um, I do believe that Factus Games taking over is going to lead to a more gamified uh, environment, I guess you could say. A little bit more focus on gaming than education. Because the making history games originally were educational games that were actually being sold in high schools and so on and so forth, um, you know, to teach people about World War II and, you know, what could happen if, say, for example, Poland knew Germany was coming and put all of its troops on the Western Front and the Russians decide not to attack Poland from the East, what could happen? Now, again, that had its problems, like, for example... The, the games, in my opinion, have never had a strong alliance system or a strong diplomacy system. So, for in the first game, if the Russians declared war on Poland, more than likely the Allies were going to declare war on the Russians. And that would lead to a scenario where the, the Russians are undoubtedly going to end up having to fight the Axis powers and the Allies. Which, I don't know if you know, but that would pretty much be suicide. Now, that also, because of the nature of these games, leads to countries like the United States being ungodly overpowered, which I guess from the whole realism standpoint makes sense, but at the same point, it's not as fun when, you know, like the United States is going to be constantly overpowered and overrunning everybody else all the time. Personally, I like mechanics. Uh, for example, the stabilization mechanic they've actually added into the past two games. I do like that uh, because it creates this scenario where, okay, you actually have to worry about things other than just fighting, which you have to worry about the stabilization of your country. Doing things like high taxation, showing which I'll show you under this tab here, uh, will actually cause high levels of unrest and political uh, instability. Now, you can also see down here what I was talking about before with the different uh, cultures and so on having an effect on your actual government support. The lower it gets, the higher chance you have of, like, rebellions and having to fight rebels and so on and so forth. It's it's mechanics that been have pretty much been uh, taken from games like Victoria 2 and, you know, were influenced anyway by games like that and then added into this. Stuff like that I like. So, And, again, I apologize if this is a little ranty. Honestly, this is probably a video that's only going to be understood by people who've been playing Making History games for a long time. Um, and again, I'm kind of going all over the place with it, but it's, I don't know, I have a lot to say regarding uh, the Great War and even the Second World War. And I haven't actually even started playing this game yet. So, but anywho, um, 
if you want kind of a quick idea of how things work, I'll pretty much just give you a quick rundown of what you can actually do. So as I've been explaining before, you can actually build buildings. Each one of these buildings has a different function or it's a different upgrade. For example, a technology center is the upgrade from a university. It allows uh, for faster research. It generates research point units, uh, which actually go towards your overall research. Uh, as you can see here, I'm currently researching field radios and uh, I need 15 research points to get it. Uh, the more universities and technology centers you have, obviously, the faster things are going to be researched. Now, with how big the research tree is, you probably want to be able to research stuff as fast as humanly possible. Now, keep in mind, bigger, more industrialized countries with more cities are going to have an advantage over you just because of the fact that they can potentially generate more money. Generally, more cities means more population, which, again, means more money. But then you have to worry about, like, more food and so on and so forth. Uh, eventually, you're going to start going down a rabbit hole. But pretty much, to sum it up, having more cities, for the most part, is a good thing. Having more resource points uh, or research, uh, resource drop-off points or whatever, like, for example, these coal mines, uh, it's going to be better than not having them at all. Some areas like Trentino here is a completely dead area now the best thing it could be is just defensive fortifications it has no resource production it has no city nothing um and in these games if you haven't played them before you're not able to actually uh build cities or whatnot you've got what you've got and you have to work with what you've got to make it to, to be successful. This makes a scenario where countries that have more provinces and more cities and more resource points to have an obviously clear advantage over countries that don't. For example, playing Italy right now, I'm basically crippled compared to Germany, which I mean, from the perspective of how the war actually went, it kind of makes sense, but I don't really think that Italy was crippled in the sense that they did not have the potential to compete against the other great powers of the world. I believe under strong leadership, they probably could have, or at least done more successful than they did. Um, now, of course, there's still a huge disadvantage fighting powers like the USSR and the United States, but I, I, I mean, even in Hearts of Iron games, you can kind of pull something out of your ass with Italy, which is something that is practically impossible in this game, if you ask me. Uh, especially the Great War, especially the other ones, and even the, well, the original making history, I believe you could. It was a lot easier to pull crazy shit out of your ass like that, just because that was the nature of the games. It was more of a sandbox than it was a full-blown, hardcore, uh, you know, historical simulation. So, but again, different opinions and so on. Uh, but anyway, so talking about resource points. You can actually click on each one of these resource points and then you can tell it to expand output, reduce output, uh, or prospect. Now, the faster way to do this is you can go over to this little tab right here, which is production. You can go to resources, and then this brings up a menu where you can go down the line, expanding, prospecting, and so on. Now, prospecting is going to increase your overall reserves. Expanding is going to start putting those reserves into output so that you're actually generating that resource. So just to generate a resource, you have an actual process. Now again, an advantage that this game has over the original making history, in the original making history, your resource production was capped. You could increase it, but you could not just find more deposits. In this game, prospecting leads to you finding more deposits which is a huge improvement in my opinion. That was one of the greatest weaknesses of making history, the original one anyway, was the fact that you could not increase resource, uh, overall resource potential at all. Like you were, you were capped at a certain amount that you could reach. You just had to increase production to reach that cap. So that's one thing I do love about these games. Uh, or love, love about the newer ones as opposed to the older ones. Uh, but anyway... So, as we show there, that's how you do resource production for coal, metal, and oil. To get more food, you actually have to click on the province, and then you go down here, and you can actually build, like, mechanized farming, enclosed farms, and so on and so forth. You basically are increasing your agricultural uh, production through building specific infrastructure improvements. 
um, through the region projects tab there. Now, it's kind of hard to do that, to, to like pretty much put all of that stuff into all of your territories when you play a country like Italy, because again, resources are limited. To Just to build mechanized farming too, for example, you need 200 oil, 200 steel, 1200 uh, gold, we'll just say gold. Uh, now, gold, of course, is easy to get. Steel and oil, not as much. And the reason why is because you have to be producing those resources in your cities with the in, in the industrial uh, the industries you've built. So if we go over here, well, let's actually find a city that has... Okay, so this one's building steel, right? It's got an output of 40. Now, the supplies used, 20 metal, 20 coal. That doesn't seem like a whole lot. But when you're actually trying to mass produce this stuff in multiple cities, as you can see, that starts ticking down real fast. So if I'm using just between these two cities, I have three industries producing or three steel mills producing uh, what 120 steel a turn. I'm using 20 metal, 20 coal for each one. So 60 metal, 60 coal, right? Now let's go over here and take a look at the resources. I am definitely not making that right here as you can see i am not a self-sufficient country that means i am having to rely on other countries to get the resources i need which actually brings us to the trade tab you can go over here you can list uh, market offers so just for an example i've already done this but i'll do it again let's say i want more coal all right well i want at least 200 units of coal um, now i'm going to put this offer on the market and at that point in time people are going to either be willing to accept those offers and give me what I want or not. And hopefully they will. I don't mind paying a little bit of money to get those resources. But something that this game requires is if you're trying to get those resources, you have to be able to ship it. You have to be able to bring it in on rail carts or roads or whatever. So that means you have to have a certain amount of shipping capacity or just like Hearts of Iron. Uh, I don't know if Hearts of Iron 4. Well, yeah, Hearts of Iron 4 has like a similar mechanic, but Hearts of Iron 2 or 3 would be a much closer example where uh, you actually had to have, well, no, you still have to have transport car, uh, convoys in Hearts of Iron 4. So it's just like that, having to have the uh, transport convoys to be able to bring in the resources from other countries, which again, it makes sense, but it's one more thing you have to worry about. So that's kind of something, I guess, is worth mentioning, in my opinion, a, a drawback of the series of games almost. Look at all the resources I have to worry about just to get things rolling along. I've got to worry about cars, I ha or well, road capacity. I have to work worry about rail capacity, shipping capacity, uh, like airlift capacity. We'll ignore nuclear bombs. Uh, arms, oil, steel, coal, metal, oil, um, food, and money. That's just the bare resources, the basic resources. That doesn't include the drain each one of these units has on those resources themselves. When combat starts, arms start falling very quickly. Um, but then, to be able to make arms, you got to make sure you have the right resources. For example, if I'm trying to build tanks, I need to have steel. And I need to have steel mills producing those resources. Uh, I have to have the steel mills producing the steel needed for the tanks to be made, right? That tank is going to be taking steel, it's going to be taking arms, it's going to be taking oil. So if you're not producing, like, if you're not producing oil, and then you're not producing fuel for that tank, and you're not producing arms, that tank is useless. It's literally useless. Um, so, you have to worry about all these various things, which again, other games still have that same philosophy, like Hearts of Iron 4. But I gotta say, I think Hearts of Iron 4 just does it better. Um, and, and that's kind of, that's the sad part, I guess, is my ultimate verdict with this game. Is what made the Great War better was that it took place in World War I. You know, kind of a niche topic. There's not a whole lot of 4X grand strategy games that focus on World War I. Most of them focus on World War II. Or, um, like, you've got the Supreme Ruler series, which has even gone so far as to go into the newer generation stuff and so on. So, I guess my, my complaint is we're doing World War II again. But at this point in time, there are games that are doing it better. And it kind of makes it hard to recommend this game when you know that there are games doing it better. Now, 
as a long time Making History fan, of course, I still at the end of the day want to support Factus Games, and I want people to purchase these games and, and support the company because I want to see more Making History games come out. Um, but honestly, if you want my recommendation, I would say buy The Great War or buy the original Making History games or even Making History 2. Now, if you really enjoy The Great War and that's like one of your favorite 4X kind of grand strategy type games, then I would highly recommend go ahead and pick up The Second World War as well because it improves on a lot of stuff. But right now, I honestly kind of think I would rather wait, see what kind of mods come out for the game, and see what people start doing with it because for me that was the greatest experience in the great war uh, was the mods like i even made my own mods uh which i had an absolute blast with like for example i made djibouti as its own country uh and then proceeded to take over uh like i think i took over like pretty much all of africa and then started fighting in the middle east i don't really remember what happened after that but i pretty much carved out an african empire from djibouti and it was really fun like doing stuff like that's really cool um so that's kind of where i think these games shine the most so truly if you're going to enjoy this experience i highly recommend going into mods or so on and so forth like that um or kind of you know trying out the great war first see if that's your cup of tea if it's your cup of tea then more than likely you're gonna really enjoy this game as well um so yeah and uh i apologize if this has been a little bit of a ranty video um or if it's it's kind of going all over the place it's hard to stay focused with making history because i have so many thoughts i've been playing these games for a decade uh so there's i have a lot to say regarding them and even their direction where they've gone and so on and so forth i Honestly, I support uh, what Muzzy Lane used to make, and I support what Factus Games is making now. And honestly, I can't wait to see what future content they come up with. And I do very much hope that they continue to keep making Making History games uh, for the future. I just kind of hope that they simplify the process a little bit in future titles to not make it so tedious. Because this is definitely a game you are not going to be able to play in one evening Let's just end my turn and see what happens. Speaking of which, like nothing's probably really going to happen because there's not a whole lot going on. The war hasn't started yet. The Germans aren't even creeping over borders. So yeah, I'm not a little premature on this one. No, this that's a lot of countries. Do you see all those countries? That's one thing I do like. I love that they added a, like a lot of events into the game. That's a really cool thing, uh, as opposed to the original game. Wow, look at this. Oh well, yep. <laughs> I am making even less resources than I was before. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Hey, yeah, let's be friends, buddies. Um, that is one thing I do like about the newer games as well, is they actually have a much better diplomacy system than the original games, that's for sure. Anyway, this has been Commissar Bro. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video, and I hope you guys... Uh, you know, at least kind of take a gander at the game, look it over, maybe look at some more reviews. There's probably someone out there who can give a better um, explanation of the full functions of the game, and I might even in the future consider doing a tutorial video explaining people in a little bit more detail how to play this game, um, or even the, uh, you know, any of the other Making History games. I know I've done a tutorial for the original game, and I've done quite a few videos for The Great War. Uh, and I think I did do a Japanese playthrough of Making History 2, or a Bulgarian one. I don't even remember. It's been so long. But uh, anyway, if you guys want to see more content for uh, Making History of the Second World War, I definitely don't mind doing that. Just let me know. But anyway, this has been CB, and I'll see you next time.